Donald Trump has just been hit with his fourth criminal indictment, a sweeping set of accusations that he tried to cheat voters in Georgia by changing the presidential election result. The Fulton County grand jury has voted to indict Donald Trump for his alleged efforts to overturn his 2020 election loss to then president elect Joe Biden. The 98 page long indictment handed up by a Georgia grand jury, it charges 41 counts, 13 of which Trump faces. This adds to dozens of charges he was already facing from three previous indictments. And we'll get to those in a moment, hang tight. But these latest ones from Georgia are the kind usually reserved for prosecuting mob bosses and mafia kingpins. This time he's accused of running a criminal enterprise to keep him in power. Indictment number four outlines 41 criminal counts against Trump and 18 co-conspirators. It states, as a matter of fact, that Trump lost Georgia in the 2020 presidential election and that he and others knowingly and willfully joined a conspiracy to unlawfully change the outcome in favor of Trump. Now, these are very serious charges and very different from all the others. So we're going to explain how and show you why altogether this may mark a major turning point in the lifelong legal saga of a man who has otherwise seemed invincible. The defendants engaged in a criminal racketeering enterprise to overturn Georgia's presidential election. You're going to hear a lot about the state of Georgia's RICO laws. Mother of mercy, could this be the end of RICO? RICO, that stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations. If you're a Sopranos fan, you've heard about it a lot. It's a set of laws created to fight organized crime. John Gotti, the Teflon Don, Gambino mob boss. He was prosecuted and convicted under RICO laws. Same with Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, another New York mobster. Because what it allows a prosecutor to do is lump a bunch of suspects together and by virtue of being part of the same organization with a common goal to lay charges at the very highest echelons of power. Essentially, it allows the prosecutor to go straight to the top. All of the co-conspirators are jointly liable for the acts of everybody. So even if you didn't participate in one part of the conspiracy, you didn't say uh, intimidate a witness, you still are held responsible for the acts of your co-conspirators. And that's what makes these things so difficult to defeat. So a prosecutor wouldn't need to show that the suspects knew each other or even that Trump knew any of the suspects. What's important is that they were all part of the same criminal enterprise, working corruptly to further the goal of undermining the election and putting Trump back in the Oval Office. Or put another way, Trump's fingerprints need not be on the messiest pieces of the puzzle. He didn't even need to have ordered all of the crimes. It's enough to show he's the head of the enterprise that did. But central to this case is a phone call that does appear to directly implicate Trump. The people of Georgia are angry. The people of the country are angry. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. Just days before Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol in 2021, Trump was on a phone call with Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, who is the top election official there. On the hour-long call, he repeatedly prods him and his lawyer, Ryan Germany, to reconsider Georgia's 2020 presidential election outcome, where Trump lost to Joe Biden. Now, do you think it's possible that they uh, shredded ballots in uh, Fulton County? Because that's what the rumor is. And also that Dominion took out machines. Uh, that Dominion is really moving fast to get rid of their uh, machinery. Do you know anything about that? Because that's illegal. Ryan Germany. No, Dominion has not um, moved any machinery out of Fulton County. We're having. Well, but no, but, but have they moved? Have they? Have they moved the inner parts of the machines and replaced them with other parts? No. You sure, Ryan? I'm sure. I'm sure, Mr. President. 
But where the call really starts to take a turn is when it becomes clear Trump considers this matter not one of fact necessarily, but one of allegiance. Mr. President, the problem uh, you have with social media, they can, people can say- no, uh, no, this isn't social media. This is Trump media. It's not social media. It's, it's, it's really not. It's not social media. I don't care about social but I couldn't care less. Social media is big tech. Big tech is on your side, you know. I don't even know why you have a side, because you should want to have an accurate election. And you're a Republican. We believe that we do have an accurate election. No, I no, you don't. No, no, you don't. You don't have. You don't have. Not even close. You got, you're off by hundreds of thousands of votes. Because you know what they did and you're not reporting it. That's a, you know, that's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. And, and, you know, you can't let that happen. That's, that's a big risk to you and to Ryan, your lawyer. That's a big risk. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have. This, it turns out, is just one of 161 individual acts outlined in the indictment. You know, there are others. Uh, For example, a plan to scam Congress, to seat pro-Trump Republican electors in various states who would deliver Trump the Electoral College votes he needed to win. Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and others, despite losing in those states. Effectively, falsifying documents, subverting the core of the American democratic system, to stay in power. There are charges relating to stealing voter data, tampering with voting equipment, making false claims of electoral fraud. It's all laid out. And all 19 defendants accused in their various roles of having the same common goal of changing the outcome of the election. Trump's former personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, lawyer and conspiracy theorist, Sidney Powell, you know, a range of people going both up and down the Trump chain of command, accused of 41 total counts. 22 related to forgery or false documents and statements, eight related to soliciting or impersonating public officers, three related to influencing witnesses, three related to election fraud or defrauding the state, three related to computer tampering, one related to perjury, and then the one charge every defendant has in common, racketeering, the state RICO laws. That alone carries a possible five to 20 year prison sentence. Okay, now the other three indictments. Former President Donald Trump indicted again, this time on charges related to the Capitol riot. I mentioned at the start, the most recent indictment against Trump is his fourth. The one before that came earlier this month, stemming from an investigation into Trump's efforts to reverse his electoral defeat in 2020, as well as his role in the January 6th storming of the U.S. Capitol. USA! 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 50 feet by the Capitol Police One advisor trying to breach and get to the Capitol. Now, there is some overlap between this case and the one we just talked about. Donald Trump criminally charged for allegedly trying to overturn the results of the 2020 election. This one also accuses Trump and six co conspirators of pushing state lawmakers and election officials to change electoral votes, one by Biden into votes won by Trump. And this scheme also involved convening fake slates of electors who would vote for Trump and then send those illegitimate tallies to Congress. Special counsel Jack Smith revealing the specific allegations in what has become the U.S. Department of Justice's largest investigation ever. On top of that, the indictment accuses Trump of using the January 6th riot as a vehicle to peddle baseless electoral fraud claims fuel conspiracy theories and put undue pressure on then Vice President Mike Pence to delay certifying the election results. 
And now, for the first time, we are learning the details of the charges that were brought against the former president, all related to his handling of classified documents after leaving office. Back in June, Trump was hit with dozens of criminal counts related to his mishandling of classified documents. And not only that he had in his possession sensitive nuclear secrets, American military vulnerabilities, and so on, but that he haphazardly stored those documents all over his Mar-a-Lago estate. He showed them to people who didn't have any kind of security clearance, and that when pressed by federal authorities to turn them over, lied about them and tried to avoid giving them back. Unprecedented is how this is being described because no other United States of America president has had their home searched by the FBI. Now, after the initial flurry of news reports, this indictment was updated, by the way. In July, three new charges were added, accusing Trump and his allies of trying to delete security footage at Mar-a-Lago. The updated indictment describes how the month before, so just days after prosecutors issued a subpoena for that footage, an employee at the resort's IT department was approached with the message, the boss wants the server deleted. Those charges related to alleged hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Hard to believe all of this was layered on top of what was already a pretty scandalous, sordid indictment. The very first we saw against Trump and the first time we've ever seen a former U.S. president indicted at all, for that matter. A nation braces for whatever comes next. The indictment of Donald Trump is a firm step in uncharted territory. The core of this case, former porn actor Stormy Daniels' plan to go public with a claim that she and Trump had had a sexual encounter. Trump, through his personal lawyer, paid her off um, a hush money scheme to cover up a sex scandal. This happened right before the 2016 election, and it was about a, a $130,000 uh, payment and this would ultimately clear his path to the presidency in 2016. But the criminal accusation was that Trump falsified business records, labeling the payoff as a legal expense when it was no such thing. What the prosecution may argue when this finally does go to trial is that this was actually an illegal campaign expense, a clear attempt to bolster his chances at becoming president by spending his own money to bury a bad story. And falsifying records to commit a crime, that is a felony offense. Now, we should be clear here. In all three indictments I've just outlined, Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty. A corrupt sitting president had his top political opponent arrested on fake and fabricated charges. He has maintained all along that these are just desperate attempts to undermine him politically. Just a bunch of Democrat partisans on a witch hunt. Trump's not guilty plea in this latest fourth indictment, the undermining of Georgia's election result, may come very soon. I am giving the defendants the opportunity to voluntarily surrender no later than noon on Friday, the 25th day of August, 2023. It's after that a judge would set an official trial date. The district attorney, Fonnie Willis, told reporters that she hopes it'll start by February of next year, which would be ahead of indictment number one in March, ahead of indictment number two in May, and we have no word yet on when Trump's third indictment trial would get underway. But what's clear here is that this latest indictment is very different from the others. According to the Georgia district attorney, there are mandatory minimum sentences for RICO state laws. No probation possible. So a guilty verdict would mean time behind bars. But also, because these are state charges, a conviction would mean that even if Trump were to be elected president again in 2024, he would have no legal authority to pardon himself. Mr. Trump, as president, couldn't dismiss or pardon a state case as he could pardon or dismiss a federal case. What's more, in the state of Georgia, and, and you know, this is pretty unique in the US, even the governor has no clemency power. So no politician could pardon Trump in this particular case. There is a pardons board in Georgia, 
but it's a really regulated process governed by the state's constitution. And a pardon could only even be considered after a minimum of five years sentence served. In short, Georgia is a tough state in which to commit a felony. And Trump's legal road ahead is likely to be far more difficult than most of us would have imagined.